Welcome to the Alive in Christ and Our Lady of Fatima family meeting. My name is Diana Newsberger, and I'll be your host today. Our guest speaker tonight is Ruth Lenker. She's a gifted lay minister with an important message on their reasonable reasons to stay. Let's begin with an opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this hour asking for your blessing and help as we're gathered together. We pray for guidance in the matters of our faith and ask that you would clearly show us the truth and how we fit into your plan. Bless this meeting according to your will. Fill us with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm for you through Christ our Lord. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. And thank you, Dana and Greg, so much for having me. It's a, it's a blessing for me to be able to, to share a little bit of faith with everybody. Briefly, I'm a parishioner at St. Ambrose Parish. I'm sure I know most of you. <laughs> um, and I just want to ask you to pray for me. I am starting a, a little uh, grassroots preaching ministry called Feed My Lamb. So I just ask for uh, your prayers in that. And I just want to share that I do have a little bit of background in uh, religious life. I spent nine years in a religious convent. So that's kind of where my training comes from and where I got some of my education. So I just want, I know we said an opening prayer, but I just wanted to put us under the mantle of our Blessed Mother and say a Hail Mary. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Father and Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This talk is called Reasonable Reasons to Stay. And I just wanted to talk about how we came up, or I came up with this uh, talk. Uh, Diana, who puts this together, she had emailed me and this email kind of struck me because it said, I cannot imagine going through the complexities, complexities of life without the real and present help God has for each of us. I, can, I am concerned that this is exactly what many of our Catholic youths do. They are drawn away from the church before they ever experience the true riches in Christ Jesus. So the term drawn away really struck me. How are we, any of us, drawn away from God, but especially teenagers and young people? Um, there can be many reasons, but for simplicity's sake, we're just going to focus on these. Simply put, it is my opinion that they just don't have enough to eat. <laughs> they don't have enough to meditate on. To meditate on something literally means to bite down on it, you know, to bite down. Our, um, our minds are made to bite down on truth. And as my spiritual director in the convent, uh, Father Pio used to say, he said, Ruth, our minds are made for truth. They're like a big puzzle that's locked up. But as we slowly feed on truth, that puzzle begins to unlock itself. That literally we're created for reality and we were created for truth. Our minds are made to expand and to grow. Our young people, just like I was a few years ago, have a deep and innate desire for this expansion, but they are often lacking the nourishment they need. And many of us are. That's why I, I named my ministry Feed My Lambs because there is a desperate need for uh, nourishment. So what happens? Our young people, our teenagers are in high school and they go off to college with this innate hunger, which is essentially good, and what happens? These professors know these students have a great capacity for uh, expansion, so they challenge them. But they also begin to indoctrinate them. They begin to indoctrinate them with the untruth, with teaching that there is no objective truth. Okay. And as I remember feeling, and if there are young people, teenagers, uh, young adults feeling, we want to feel smart. We want to feel challenged. 
We want to feel that we're taken seriously and fed. So young people begin to desperately listen to whomever makes them feel that way, mainly their teachers and their professors. And it happened to me. I almost left the faith, the whole church, at 19, 20 years old. I was taking a course at Pima College. And this is not a knock on Pima College at a great time there, uh, for the most part, but I had to take this honors course. And it was only about 17 of us with two professors. So there was a lot of presence in this room with these professors. And it was crazy. Uh, it was so crazy, I can't even talk about it. But it wrecked my brain, it wrecked my faith. I left that year thinking, I don't believe in God. I don't, um, I don't believe there's any objective truth. Don't believe in the Catholic faith. And it was very bad. And only through God's grace did he work through my cousin and kind of bring that, um, that, bring that back around. And thank God he called me into religious life <laughs> when I was 21. So how do we combat this? How do we fight this slow drawing away from God? Well, we feed them. We begin to feed our young people simply the basics of philosophical thinking and theology and the wonderful impact that this can have on our lives. It literally had the power to change my life when I tapped into this. In just a preface, um, I am not an expert on philosophy or theology, but I do have a great passion and a love for, for what I've learned and it truly has changed my life. So my goal here is not to give you an expert thesis on either, but rather to impart a love, just to give love, a theological thinking, and to pass on a fire of truth. You know, I want to give you that torch because much of our faith, as much as it needs to be taught, it needs to be caught. Okay. And maybe through this small presentation, you'll discover new reasons to stay in the church. So what is philosophy? It's a great, you know, intellectual word, but in basics terms, it's man's search for truth. It's man reaching up to God, who is reality, by means of natural, by our natural means, okay? By definition, it is the study of the nature, causes, or principles of reality based on logical thinking. So it's how we ponder and grapple to know God, to know truth by our natural means and everyday experiences. Okay? So, and what is theology? So if, if, if philosophy is us reaching up to truth, theology is God reaching down to man. It's the study of God. God reaching down to us through, through divine revelation, and how that was given to the Jewish people and the Hebrew nation. And it's also given to us in, in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, the final revelation. So in this talk, I'm going to be just presenting some basic questions, things experienced by us in our everyday lives, and just asking you, is this reasonable to consider? Let's talk about the word spirit. You know, we hear this so much in society. We hear it in the Gospels. We use it in the liturgy, in the Mass. You know, the Lord be with you, and we say, and with your spirit. But do we have a grasp or an understanding of what that means when we say spirit? You know, we hear it so much. You know, I'm totally spiritual, but I'm not religious. You know, there is a great and innate desire everybody has to be a spiritual being, okay? But do we have one? Do you and I have an animating force inside of us? Is our body being animated? Animation. I thought, well, it's an example is when cartoons are brought to life. That's a form of animation. My sister and I, uh, for the Easter octave, we just got done watching The Prince of Egypt which is a wonderful old school animated film um, about Moses and the Exodus. 
it's wonderful. And I like to go through the special features because I'm kind of a nerd. And <laughs> we were watching the wonderful way that they created the Prince of Egypt. You know, if you never watched it, how they did it was they have a piece of paper and they draw a figure, you know, with his arm like this. And they take another piece of paper and they draw the figure with his arm like this. And they go through like 50 uh, to 100 pieces of paper. And then you flip through all of them and you have a character that literally comes to life. That is a form of animation. To give something life that has no life of its own. Okay? But hear this, both are necessary. The material and the mind. There is no animation without that piece of paper and without that pencil. And there is no animation without the artist's mind. You need the matter and the mind. So just like that paper, what does bring my body to life? I mean, is it just my organs, this, this brain that weighs about three pounds, you know, talking to you or my heart beating? Because the brain and the heart are material, okay? I'm talking to you and having a conversation with you. And hopefully I have a personality <laughs> and a sense of humor. You know, how can that be just our material organs? Our bodies, just like that paper, needs an artist's mind. Is it reasonable to think that we have an animating force in us that is non-material? a spirit. If not, if some of you are like, yeah, I, I don't know about that. I ask you with great compassion, have you ever been to a funeral? And it's a very powerful thing, as I'm sure some of you have, have some of you know. Have you ever seen with your own eyes a person who is dead? In other words, a dead corpse. Now that may sound a little graphic, and it is. Um, our Lord on the cross is called a corpus. It's his body uh, there without the spirit. And honestly, it's an amazing and terrifying thing uh, to view because something, something is missing. Something is tangibly gone. Where something was is no longer there. I was able to uh, attend my aunt's uh, funeral three years ago. She was my aunt and my godmother. It is my mom is an identical twin. And so she looked just like my mom, had the same sense of humor as my mom, and she died uh, very quickly of aggressive liver cancer. Within 10 days that she found out she had stage four liver cancer, 10 days she was gone. It was really incredible and a huge thing for our family and of course my mother. So I went to the funeral and I walk inside this beautiful Catholic church and it was so powerful because you have people over here praying and I walk up to the open casket, the coffin, and there's my aunt laid out and it looks like my aunt. She's dressed like my aunt, her hair's done like my aunt but it's not quite my Aunt Lori. And my mom walks up and here is my mom who looks just like this person alive. You know, there's my mom beautiful and looking at her deceased sister. And I look at my mom and I look at my aunt, I look at my mom and I just go, wow, something is gone. Something is no longer there. Where is she? My aunt gave me a great gift. The ability to see with my own eyes that separation that happens at death. The body literally leaves the material, excuse me, the spirit literally leaves the material body. And that is the only time in life that that happens. I'll just say this, no matter what uh, modern day ideologies are saying, this craziness, Death is the only time that that separation happens. Christopher West just made this statement. That's the only time it happens, okay? So I challenge you, do we have an animating force within us or not? 
Is there a spirit animating us? Now here's the Catholic teaching of our spirit, the human spirit. And this comes from the book Theology for Beginners by Frank Sheed, who is a wonderful Catholic lay uh, theologian. A wonderful. Okay, very orthodox. Our human spirit is the ability to know and to love. It is thinking and our will. Thinking thoughts, our intellected reason, and loving the ability to choose, to choose moral actions or to choose immoral actions. He says, it is the element inside of us that knows and loves and therefore decides. It is what animates our material body, our skin, our organs, our fluid, excuse me, and the beautiful flesh that makes up our whole person. We are flesh and uh, spirit. And it is striking that our spirits mingle with this flesh. And did you know, brothers and sisters, we are different from all other creatures of God. We are the only one that has this beautiful um, complementarity. The, the, the angel world is pure knowing and loving. That's what angels are, they're pure spirit, pure ability to know and to love. And then the animal world, the plant vegetation, they have a body, uh, but they do not have a spirit. They don't have an intellect or will. They do have an animating force in them, an aspect of God, but it's not a spirit. Okay, so that's a bit of theology. Maybe we go into some more of it sometime. It's so fun. So if we can reasonably say that we have a spirit, an animating force inside of us, is it also reasonable to believe that there may be laws that govern this spirit? Just as our bodies have laws that govern it. So what laws are we talking about in our biological life? Well, the law of gravity. And everybody says, ah, ha, ha, law of gravity, yeah. Well, I have a great respect for the law of gravity. I felt its painful consequences when I was eight years old. I, on Halloween night, uh, got up on our swing set with my little sister, Megan, and I decided that I was going to show off. And I said, uh -huh, can your friends do this? And I flipped off of the swing set. My leg went like this. My whole body weight landed on my leg, crushed it, and it spiral uh, fractured in eight places on Halloween night. I got a crack for each year I was born. <laughs> eight cracks. Ouch. It really hurt. It hurt so much. I thought I was going to die. Most painful thing in my life. Until my, until my body went into shock. So, yes, there are laws to gravity in our body. The laws of eating and drinking. If you don't eat for 30 to 40 days, you're going to die. If you don't drink fluids two to seven days, you're going to die. You're going to shut down. Okay? There are laws to our immune system. If you and I stay up all night, don't take any vitamins, don't take care of our, ourselves, um, we're most likely going to get a cold. Or if I gash my arm, don't clean it, don't uh, fix it up, it's, it's not gonna heal. And here is another one I wanna bring up because of society. It is the law of reproduction, okay? Why? Because this is a very uh, rampant thing in our society that we can go against the laws of reproduction. See, conception is a natural law to intimacy with, with a man and a woman, sexual intimacy, as we all know. I'm, we all know this, but I'm just reiterating. <laughs> I mean, when that little egg and the little spermie goes inside, there's the, the, the mixing of DNA. That is a totally new, irrepeatable, uh, undeniable new being. It is a new human being. It's called a human embryo. 
it is not a fertilized egg. Okay, an egg, once it's fertilized, is no longer an egg. It is a totally new being, and it's a human. Uh, Trent Horn in his book, uh, his pro-life book, says, saying a fertilized egg is like saying a married bachelor, okay? Once you're married, you're no longer a bachelor. You've changed in your essence. So the struggle in society is sometimes to think, well, you know, yikes, I had relations with someone, I got pregnant, <gasps> something went wrong. Well, no, actually, something went right. Something went biologically correct because there are significant consequences for beautiful creation of life. There are consequences and we don't have the right to change or manipulate those. So just a little plug. Our flesh is governed by laws, whether we like it or not. I mean, I don't like the fact that if I don't eat for two to three hours, I get really angry and frustrated and hangry. So we're bound to it because we're human beings. So brothers and sisters, if there are real laws to our flesh, is it reasonable or even probable, which means very likely, that our spirits are bound by laws because we've just gone over biological laws. You see, we cannot see or touch our spirits, but there are many things that we can't see that have infinite value, do they not? And what things are, am I talking about? I'm talking about love and thought. And as Frank Sheets says, you can't call love and thought nothing. Well, they're called nothing because they have no shape, size, form, uh, length, width. They have no monetary value. So you could say, well, they're nothing. But they're not nothing. Because love and thought are the most powerful forces in the universe. So if we can conclude that we need spiritual laws, is it reasonable also that if God is a higher spirit than us, the almighty spirit, that he can give us the laws that govern us, that keep us ordered, that keep us healthy, and that keep us alive. Is it reasonable that God would give us these laws to a certain people at a certain time in history in the form of rules? We all live and know the benefit of rules. The rules, and they're rules of life. And as we know, he gave to the Jewish people in the form of the Ten Commandments to keep them spiritually alive. You know, they have do this and don't do this. Because you're gonna get hurt if you do this or don't do this. And they're very concrete. And then is it reasonable that he could perfect the law of life in the full revealing of who he actually is as God in the person of Jesus Christ? That God could come as a man in his body with his spirit to communicate to us the full revealing of who God is as the Trinity, which, we, which is another fascinating topic. And that he could establish a church that also gives us laws of life. It is the teachings of the church. Is this reasonable, brothers and sisters? Even though something is profound and amazing, doesn't mean it's not reasonable, okay? And Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it to the full. And I just want to say just a bit on uh, Eastern religions and New Age religions. Just a little plug. You know, they look very attractive at first. And for many reasons for people, and I'm not judging reasons, they look attractive. But one thing is that they have no real objective spiritual laws. And this can look good in the beginning. I was very attracted to Buddhism and different things uh, in the beginning. But, you know, that freedom from any objective moral law, in the end, it doesn't really work. For one, 
it's just unreasonable. <laughs> Why? Because it goes against everything we've just been talking about. It goes against you and I's experience of how we need laws in the natural world. So why would our spirits be any different? And these are actually religions that very much uh, accept and acknowledge that we have a spirit. So why wouldn't we need real laws just as our body has laws? It's, it's unreasonable. And two, and I say this with great empathy, it just might bite you in the bum to live outside of any objective moral law. And what do I mean by that? You might find the painful results of being free from the law. One thing is that a lot of people like to not live inside of the Ten Commandments, okay? Um, you know, a lot of people either married or just living together, you know, I don't, they don't adhere to any Ten Commandments. Um, like, and one of them is the Sixth Commandment, thou shall not commit adultery. So what they feel binds them is this undying commitment and love. But when there is nothing binding you above or beyond your feelings for each other, such as what binds us is obedience to God, not just love of your spouse, but an obedience to God. Like, I got to obey this stuff. When that love, and I've seen it, when they love rears out five, ten years later, if that love's, love's drawing thin and there's no obedience to anything higher, your spouse just might cheat on you if they find something better when things are going rough. And that might be a painful experience of being free from any law that's higher than you. And you might have wished that, gosh, I wish they would have had to be obedient to something other than us. So it could be painful. And this begs the question, are we okay? This is the big question. Is there nothing innately wrong with man? You ever thought about that? Am I okay? You're okay? We're okay? Well, in the words of Bishop Barron on one of his homilies, he says, oh, come on, give me a break. <laughs> it's great. I mean, a lot of people don't believe that there is anything innately wrong with us. And I say, if you believe that, then you've got to prove it. And you've got a big job to do because it's going to be really hard to prove that. I mean, just turn on your television any day of the week and see how screwed up society is. See the world in chaos for, from anything from who we are, what we are, what we need, what we don't need. Or just observe yourself for two or three days. Why is it difficult to be good? Why is it difficult to choose moral actions? I mean, don't we all want that? St. Paul says, why do I do what I don't want to do? And I don't do what I do want to do. And this is where I just love. He has an internal struggle of his soul. Even 2,000 years ago, St. Paul was struggling with his internal desires. And in that, he was revealing one of the most amazing doctrines that changed my life. Many of you know it. Many of you probably don't know it. I didn't. It's a Latin word, and it's called concupiscence. And why this doctrine is not taught more, I have no idea. Because when I got into the convent and I learned what concupiscence was, it seriously changed my life because I realized why I do what I do, why I don't do what I don't do, and what we're doing in our spiritual life. But I'm jumping ahead now. Concupiscence is a spiritual disease, okay? That's why we talk about spirit, so that we can understand a spiritual disease in our intellect, in, a, in our will. It's a cancer that we live with even after we're baptized. Okay, so when we're baptized, that removes what's called the stain of original sin, like Jesus tells us to do. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But concupiscence 
is like a residue that remains with us, okay? By definition, it is a jumble of disordered cravings that naturally makes us kind of lean towards bad behaviors, towards vice and sin. They kind of say, you want to do what's good, but you're already, it makes you kind of already half committed to what's immoral. So we have this internal struggle. And that's why God is, we have divine mercy because he knows we have this struggle within us. You know, we still have free will. We still choose sin. We have to own our sins and go to confession. But God does have mercy on us because he knows we're his creatures that struggle with this. And I'm telling you that, honestly, when the light bulbs went off in my head, I said, oh my gosh, this is, this is it. This is the answer to life. Why are, I don't know why it's not preached about more. Because it's proof that original sin actually exists. Because look, if there's nothing really wrong with us, then we would always do what we really wanted to do we would naturally be self-controlled. I mean, I, I wouldn't have any problem within myself. I mean, there's an example. I mean, if I'm full, I would never overeat. I mean, I don't want to do that. So why would I do that? I would never over drink. I don't really want to do that. So why would I do that? I would always apologize if I needed to apologize. There wouldn't be no, you know, uh, struggle with pride. We'd always be faithful in our relationships because there's no, I mean, there's nothing wrong with me. So why wouldn't I always choose what is ultimately the best thing for me? And concupiscence gives us an understanding that we're not just poof, we're going into heaven from day one. No, it's a process. We're baptized. We receive confirmation in the Eucharist and we fall and we get up and we fall and it's a process. Oh, so much. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we really are sick in a way. And I don't mean to be like a downer here, but we are beautiful creatures of God. We're made in his image and likeness, but we do have an illness. And it means that we need something. It makes us humble, humble because we need something. And that is where the secular society has it wrong. Secular society says, I'm okay simply because I am. I'm all good. I don't need anything. There's nothing wrong with me. But we say, no, I know there's a problem and I need something. So if it's reasonable to think that there is something wrong inside of our spirits, does it need to be fixed? Do we need medicine? Is there, is there medicine for our spirit? And if we do need medicine, can we listen to the one who actually said, I came to heal the sick? Those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. That's Luke 5.31. Or before he heals the, the paralytic, the, the paralyzed man, he says, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? He heals his soul before he heals his body because Jesus came to heal us from within and he gives us the medicine of grace. Amazing grace. When I realized that grace was medicine, I said, hallelujah, this is so different than what I ever understood. Grace is the life and power of God to heal us to change us and to feed us. And just a small testimony is that God fills my life so much, brothers and sisters. I became my own missionary last year. I spend most of my time reading and praying and trying to write talks and evangelize. People don't evangelize for the sake of evangelization because it's hard. We want to give you something that we have. God so fills my soul that it makes my life worth living. I mean, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I don't make a lot of money. I, I don't make any money. Um, 
I don't go a lot of places and I'm not saying, I mean, all those things are wonderful. They're awesome. But I'm saying that even without those things, God fills my life with the medicine. So where do we find those, that medicine most powerfully? It's within the sacraments of the Catholic church in baptism, which we've already gone over that effusion of grace in the Eucharist, I mean, we're literally eating God's medicine. And we can't dive deep, deep enough into the Eucharist. So I invite you to stay for the Eucharist, my gosh, in confession, where God heals us uh, of our sins and, and fills us with his life. And matrimony, married people have the ability to draw grace and medicine down into their lives simply by their vocation. That's amazing to me because I'm not married and I won't be. And that's amazing to me. Um, and honestly, like I said before, I, I said, this is the answer to all of life's problems. So the reality of concupiscence, that we have a disease, but grace, that we have a medicine. This is good news. And that's just a bit of philosophy and theology. And I know we're just moving right along here, but I also want to shift to just one more everyday thought um, segment. Is that how many of you, I can't see most of you, but how many of you are gardeners like plants? Well, my daddy is a gardener and he uh, passed the love of plants on to me. But have you ever seen a plant that is truly not placed in the right place? You know, it's not getting enough sunlight. My sister and I have two garlic plants in our front yard. And uh, one is in the full sunlight. It's got beautiful leaves and its little stems are beautiful with big purple bulbs and it's healthy. And the other one is placed in about three quarters shade. And the arms are getting really long and just gangly looking and it's reaching out to the sun. It's got bad color and it's kind of drabby even in the natural world, things need enough light to live. We might not all know that, but do we take the time to think about it? Plants have one of the most amazing processes on the earth and it's called photosynthesis. It's where they actually make their own food, but they need sunlight for this process. If they don't get enough light, they die or get sick or wilty. So it is with us. We need enough light to live, or we begin to desperately reach out to the sun for light. I mean, yes, we all need vitamin D from sunlight, but if we have that spirit, then it needs light to live. And is it reasonable to listen to the one who actually says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, they don't walk in darkness. They will have the light of life. John 8, 12. No other spiritual teacher, good spiritual teacher said, I am the light of the world. Is this reasonable to consider? And before I conclude, I just wanna do one more amazing reason to stay in the Catholic Church, more historical and very beautiful. Another reason to stay in the Catholic Church is that, well, one, yes, there has been crazy stuff that's happened in the last 20 years, revealing in the last four years with the scandal and the crazy um, uh, cover-up and, and all that stuff. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, it, there has been a lot uh, that has happened that has been extremely difficult for a lot of people. And a lot of people have unfortunately left the faith because of that. Um, so there's much in the church that needs to be cleansed and healed, uh, changes to be made, forgiveness to be sought. And yes, we need to acknowledge that. And we cannot allow ourselves in the midst of scandal and darkness to forget our church's unbelievable story. 
And this litany comes from Matthew Kelly that I just had to throw in there because it's amazing. Another reason to stay in the Catholic Church is every day in the Catholic Church, it feeds more people, houses more people, clothes more people, visits more imprisoned people, takes care of more sick people, and educates more people than any institution on the planet Earth or ever has. Everything good about modern day healthcare emerged from the Catholic Church, hospitals, and through religious orders. Education for the masses. The church gave birth to education for people who were not of nobility. In the past, only kings, queens, duchesses, dukes, earls, and peoples of higher birth or bloodline could receive an education. So you and me, if we weren't noble, sorry, no education for you. And guess who stepped in and changed that? It was the Catholic Church. So we cannot forget our story. So, brothers and sisters, I invite you and I encourage you to stay in the Catholic Church. To give Jesus Christ just a new look. To start thinking more deeper, theologically, philosophically, about life. Read some books on theology and Christian the uh, spirituality. And please, don't just leave because something looks better for the moment or because it's difficult. I think about how many young people suffer from divorce, divorced homes, because their parents gave up too soon. One may have left because things were too difficult, hard to believe, or that looked better somewhere else for a while. But if they just could have stayed long enough to learn, reconcile, grow, and, and heal through God's grace. To struggle with what you believe, a lot in our faith is hard to believe sometimes. And a lot of it is just an act of our will and an act of love. But don't leave. Please stay, experience, learn, commune with others, learn from others, walk with others. And when it is, it is when you have enough courage to stay that you may come to believe. So thank you so much for your time tonight. God bless you. Thank you, Ruth. That was wonderful. Praise the Lord. Hear that Praise wisdom. God. Whenever two or three gather in his name, he's present. He loves you. At this time, I'm going to ask you to spend just a brief time privately with God. Pray about what you've heard tonight and how you can use it. Meditate on the scriptures that inspired this talk. If you have never said yes to Jesus or you want to renew your relationship with God, pray the prayer in the blue box. happy to attend in this uh, class. I appreciate Ruth for wonderful teaching and beautifully she explained the things about the spirit and also how the Catholic life mm -hmm. and it reminded me Sunday's gospel reading um, I am the wine you are the branches whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit because without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the founder of the Catholic Church. There are 40,000 churches or denominations are there, but who founded the church, Catholic Church? It is Jesus Christ and apostles. And if you read the Acts of Apostles, all 28 chapters speak about our tradition. If you want to understand better about our Catholic faith, go to the sources. The sources are um, Acts of Apostles, 
how Peter, Paul, and other apostles, they contributed and they grew in their faith, how they received the Holy Spirit. So when Ruth explaining the things, I remember these things. And it's a beautiful thing that we are in the church that founded by Jesus Christ. There is no other church, only Catholic church. And also we are connected to something larger than ourselves. It is not just we are one country. It is universal. When Paul, when Saul was persecuting the church, uh, all apostles and other people, Jesus appeared to him. Damascus experience, we say. And Jesus asked, why are you persecuting me? He did not ask, why are you persecuting apostles? He said, why are you persecuting me? By itself is a mystical body of Christ. The church is a mystical body of Christ. So that's why being part of the Catholic church and through our baptism is a gateway to our sacramental life. We have the tradition, we have the word of God come together and help us to receive the life. The spirit beautifully explained and how we receive godly life through the sacraments and remaining with him, we bear much fruit. And without remaining with God, with Jesus, and we, we are the losers, it's not the God. One of the experiences that also, um, something that I experienced when I was preaching and doing a lot of work, ministry, one pastor from other denomination, he asked me, um, we like your preaching and we like your prayer life. Why don't you join in our denomination? He welcomed me. Then I said, so who began your church? So that man said, the, the founder of that church. Then I said, do you know who, uh, uh, who is the founder of the Catholic church? He said, I don't know. Then I said, uh, it is Jesus and explain to him. I live as a Catholic. I die as a Catholic. There is no second option for, for me. Yes, dear brothers and sisters, and being part of the mystical body of Christ, let the spirit flow from your life and uh, be the ministry fruitful through the help of God. God bless you. Ruth, I'm happy that uh, you took your time and uh, explained very well. God bless you. Well, thank you everybody for taking the time uh, to come and to listen. And I hope that it was fruitful and that you can pass some of that on, especially to younger people who really struggle. So thank you all very much. for. Thank you for coming. It was such a pleasure. And thank you, Father Paolo, for popping in and giving us your words of wisdom. Thank you. You are welcome. In the name of the Father, mm -hmm. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. As we gather together through this class, you bless us through our beloved sister Ruth, who preached about our life and spirit and Catholic life and how we connected together. Let this inspiring talk, I believe that your intervention was there. As we are praying, bless Ruth more and more 
and guide her to proclaim, to witness to you, to all the people, those who need your light and help all the our brothers and sisters who gather here to talk the, the message that we received and reach our experience of you. And also we pray, fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit, only Holy Spirit, through that we are reminded the things and also explain the things. That is why your son Jesus, who said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you receive the power when you receive the Holy Spirit. And we receive Holy Spirit, the power that help us to be strengthened, to be witness to other people. Your son Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. This is not only for the apostles, it is all the disciples. We are the light. We are the salt. Salt adding taste to food. And also the color of salt white. It's a purity, our holiness and preservation and preserve the society with all the good things. And also light, which dispels the darkness, help other people to see, to see the things clearly. As we are praying, let your guidance, your spirit be with us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with and your spirit. May Almighty God bless us, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you again, everybody. And thank you, Dana and Greg, for having me and promoting this. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. We're truly blessed. Absolutely.